Thank you very much for joining us for a webinar on subepithelial connective tissue graphs. Now, just before I start, can you please type where you live in the comments so that we can tell the sound is working? Uh, it will, the feedback takes about 30, 30 seconds, so just type in where you are and then we'll know that the sound, you're actually getting sound. Feel free to uh, write questions. So I will answer questions at the end as usual. So if you have some questions, you can put them in now. We will collect them and put them together and I'll answer them later. Uh, how's sound? <clears throat> now I will uh, show you a few other, um, I don't know sounds going. <coughs> Uh, I'll show you a few other thing, things later on. I'm going to show you some stuff that has gone wrong when I've done these procedures. Uh, I'll talk about the things, not the things that I've had go wrong, which tend to be more complex, but the main errors that beginners make in this particular type of procedure. So uh, it's very important to understand where you're likely to go wrong so that you can try and avoid it when you're doing these sort of procedures. Unfortunately, you do need to know some anatomy. Um, in particular, you need to know a couple of blood vessels and some nerves because uh, when you do subepithelial connective tissue grafts, you're frequently harvesting close to the greater palatine artery and also you're harvesting close to the nerves of the palate as well. So um, these arteries are not of great concern. If you cut them, um, the patient is not going to die. Uh, but the bleeding will stop generally on its own unless they're taking some type of anticoagulant. But you will get a fright, okay? Whenever you cut an artery, you're gonna frighten yourself. So the, uh, obviously we need to know the greater palatine artery, but most importantly, you need to know that the um, vessels in the maxilla are hugely anastomosed. So you have blood vessels, you have the greater palatine artery, you have the nasopalatine artery coming down, um, and you also have, or nasopalatine, sorry. Okay, you also have the arteries that are coming down through the side wall of the uh, sinus and also through the floor of the sinus through the actual palate itself. So if you look at the if you look at a picture like this you'll actually see all these little holes in the palate and this is where there's tiny blood vessels coming through there and nerves as well. So that's important because uh, it can affect the sensation of the palate. If you if you raise a graft from the palate and actually lift the periosteum off, particularly in this area here, then there's a risk that the patient will get a strange sensation on their palate, which can be permanent. So you can actually get a, um, you know, a feeling of numbness or altered sensation on the palate. So that that is uh, important to know. Now, mostly we need to know where this artery is because that's the one you're most likely to cut, uh, and we'll come back to how you deal with that later. Now, I'm just going to go through some cases to show a few different styles. Now with the subepithelial connective tissue graft, there's really two main types. There's the, as far as the harvest goes, you can mostly either take the deep tissue that's against the, the heart, against the bone, leaving an, a window or a trapdoor of overlying tissue, which you then suture back into place. Or you take basically a free gingival graft, which we talked about recently, and then you remove the epithelium. Now, because as soon as you remove the epithelium, it then becomes subepithelial. So um, some people go, oh, that's a free gingival graft because you've taken the surface layer. That's not true. As soon as you remove the epithelium, it's subepithelial. Um, the surface layer of the tissue is much more dense and higher and it's got a lot more keratin in it. Um, so it has different characteristics. It tends not to be as pretty, but it tends to be more robust. So that's what you might consider whether you're thinking to harvest the very deep layer uh, of the tissue or the more surface layer. The other issue is the size. When you take the deep tissue, you can't get as big a graft as if you take the surface tissue because you have to worry about the arteries. Uh, when you're actually doing the graft, the vast majority of grafting of this sort that I do now is via a tunnelling approach. Now, not always, but mostly I'm going to do some type of tunnelling. Now, tunnelling, we can tunnel from the gingival margin, we can tunnel from up high. It doesn't really matter where you tunnel. The main thing about tunneling is that you don't cut the papillas. This is important for a couple of reasons. One, there's no chance of your flap coming open if you don't cut the papillas. So if there's no flap, it won't come open. But secondly, there's blood supply. So we've got blood coming down through the vessels up here, 
Okay, we have a little bit of an anastomosis from the pellet, just for a couple of millimetres, but there are actually blood vessels coming out of the bone that is interproximal. So the interproximal bone has blood vessels that come out and think. So by the less cutting we do, the more blood supply, basically. Uh, when we're using um, when we're using the uh, uh, tunneling in this particular thing, you can use uh, particular instruments um, like an Orban knife or a uh, um, you can use those micro uh, what are they the ophthalmic blades, which are a micro blade. Uh, it doesn't really matter what type of blade you have. What is important is that you know what you're trying to achieve. So I don't really care whether you, now this is an Orban knife, which is a specialised instrument. It comes from the Pat Allen kit. Uh, basically, it's a sharp knife. You can go up and tunnel in underneath there, and then you can take a piece of connective tissue from the pallet and suture it into place, and use your sling sutures or whatever type of suture you wish to pull it down. One thing that's important is that um, all sutures will do a faint scarring on the tissue. So right here at the line angle, so we're not out at the maximum width of the tooth, but at the line angle here, the scar is probably the least noticeable position. Uh, obviously, the less scarring is better, not, not only for aesthetics, but also if you have to go back and do a second surgery, scarring is a nuisance. It's very difficult to manage. It's not flexible. It's difficult to raise. It's difficult to split. Uh, obviously, we're going to close the wound now. One of the things, when people take deeper tissue and then close the close the uh, epithelium back over the top with sutures like this, they often feel like it's going to be less painful. But in my experience, it makes no difference whether it is, uh, whether you take a deeper layer and, then, and get primary closure or whether you take a free gingival graft and de-epithelialize. So if you manage the wound correctly, the pain is not really an issue with either one. Uh, when you do this type of approach, quite often that tissue that's overlying will be quite thin and you'll get necrosis of the overlying epithelium. And so you will essentially end up with the same type of uh, uh, wound healing as if you'd done a free digital graft. So you get necrosis, you basically end up with an open ulcer. Uh, we'll go to a slightly more difficult case, this one here. You can see that we're, we've got a whole range of issues here. So mostly when we're doing these graphs, we're looking at recession. But in this particular case, we've got recession. Uh, obviously, we've got loss of papillas, loss of bone, loss of everything there. So uh, this is a particularly difficult case. And when you're doing very difficult cases, the most important thing is to have realistic expectations. So I haven't told this lady, I'm going to recreate everything. I'm going to bring all the tissue down and it's all going to look like new when I'm finished. I said, I will try and get it down as far as possible. And something like this, we want to expect to bring the tissue down where we can and have the patient pre-framed for lifting the tissue on the other teeth if necessary. Obviously, this is a maximum smile. She doesn't normally smile as high. Um, so you could argue, well, she's got a slightly gummy smile. Why don't you just lift everything up? Um, she has a very mobile or a hypermobile lip. So if we take the gingival margins right up to the where her lip is at full smile, then a lot of the time she'll look like her teeth are too long. Uh, just doing a bit of assessment here. So this is roughly where I want to bring the tissue to. I don't want to bring it all the way down because I think then she'll look like she's got two gummy smiles. So we're wanting to think about this before. If in doubt, always bring the tissue down too much because it's very easy to cut away. Okay, Grafting is very difficult to bring tissue down, very easy to get rid of it once you have it there. So if you're not sure how far to graft the tissue down, graft it too far, okay? The worst that can happen is that you have to do a gingivectomy later. Uh, a gingivectomy on a grafted tissue takes very little amount of time, so if you haven't quoted for it and you're not sure that you can charge for it, it won't really matter. Uh, we'll just skip through a few slides here. So in this particular case, we're looking at, the, looking at what we've got now. What I want to do is, first of all, we can see that there's a tori right there. That won't affect the harvesting. But whenever you see a tori, always just keep it in mind because if you need a bone graft, that's an excellent source to take one from. It's probably one of the least painful places to take a bone graft from uh, because the swelling is not such an issue. Whereas if you're taking bone grafts down here on the side of the jaw or the chin, wherever you normally take them, their face is going to swell out. So that's now we're not going to do a bone graft in this case, just soft tissue. But what we do want to do is we want to know where the things are going to end up. Now, you can do a wax up if you wish. I quite often 
do a mock-up. So in this case, I've spent maybe 20 minutes. I have rebuilt the teeth with uh, composite resin to the height that I want. Now, what's very important here is if you are going to do crowns at some point and you're going to do soft tissue surgery, it's best to do a feather-edged crown prep before you do the soft tissue surgery because it actually makes it much easier to bring the tissue down. In this case, we took off all the old dentistry. You can see I haven't done heavy margins except there because that was an old crown. Now, even there, I have uh, rebuilt that, that margin because I don't want a heavy margin. Now, what you can see is in these preps, you can see that they are convergent occlusally. So they're tapered occlusally. Now, when tissue contracts around a tooth, if the tooth is convex, then the tissue wants to ride up towards the root. If the tooth is tapered occlusally, as the tissue tightens around it, it'll want to go down towards the crown. So where you can, if you're really struggling to get um, uh, as much coverage as possible and you're planning to do restorative dentistry anyway, always do the crown prep like this, no margin, and you can see the tooth is tapered occlusally so that as the tissue heals, it will want to ride down towards the incisal edge. Now, obviously, when we make our temporaries, we're not going to extend the temporary back up to where we're trying to cover. So I've set the temporaries up so that they're to the height that I want to achieve. And now I'm going to try and graft down to that. Now, I've actually, you can't see it here, this lateral incisor matches the other lateral incisor. But when we go to the later pictures here, you'll see I've actually shortened the lateral incisor so I can get more tissue volume in there. And then once it's healed, I can then start creating an ovate pontic. So when you're grafting pontic sites um, or sometimes implant sites, it's best to overgraft and then you can trim the tissue back or shape the tissue or do what you want. Okay, Too much tissue, always better than not enough. Uh, now, in this case, I'm tunneling and I'm tunneling using a Vista approach. So I've done an incision up high in the sulcus. Um, now, the way I do this incision is important, okay? Uh, we do a, a very light incision just through the mucosa. If you go straight down to the bone here, there's a couple of blood vessels you can cut. And because most of my patients are older and they take blood thinners uh, or anticoagulants, they're prone to bruising if you cut these vessels. So just a very shallow incision through the uh, mucosa, then scissors to get blunt dissection down to the periosteum, and then put the scalpel back in if you want to go subperios. This one is not uh, subperiosteal, it is, I think I've just split the tissue, I don't actually recall. Now I do do this, this type of graft two ways, I do it either um, splitting the tissue, so I'm basically just going in above the periosteum, and in other cases I will actually lift the periosteum and place the graft on it, I don't really mind how you do it. Uh, now, I have told this patient that she is going to have a lot of pain because I want to do big grafts from both sides of her palate at once. Uh, now, remember when the patient says, will I get pain? They're not always negotiating. Like they're not, it's not, if I'm going to get pain, I won't do the procedure. They just want to know. So if the patient says, will I get pain? You say, yes. Yes, you're going to get pain. You'll get five days, four to five days of pain it'll be sore, you'll get over it, okay? So often they just want to know, don't lie, because if you lie, then they don't trust you. So in this case, I've got both these graphs, um, just sitting it over there, that's just for Facebook, and then we tunnel through and push it down. Now, what we've got here is, if we look in this area, there's scarring. There was a lot of scar tissue from the previous endodontic treatment before this lady lost the tooth. So tunneling under this area is very, very difficult, okay? And the tissue is never going to look quite right because there's there's this tension when you have um, scar tissue. It doesn't stretch the way normal tissue does, so very difficult. So when you see scars from previous surgery, expect to take much, much longer to do the surgery, whatever type of surgery it is, because they're just difficult to manage. If you go carelessly with scar tissue, you will buttonhole or damage the flap. You'll actually, instead of going underneath the flap, you'll slide and poke a hole through the flap, and then you've got a risk of flap necrosis. I have had, not with this procedure, I have had flat necrosis three or four times, usually doing bone grafts where you raise the flat and then for whatever reason, either you've got it too tight or you, when you do your periosteal release, you cut too much or whatever. Um, in those situations, uh, it's horrendously painful for the patient. So the entire flat dies and you get healing by secondary intent 
from way up here to down there. So always be very gentle with your flaps. Um, you will only need one lot of flat necrosis to never want to have another one. Now this is uh, a week later. Now, the sutures serve some purposes. Now with these type of grafts, I used to take the sutures out at one week. I now take the sutures out at uh, more commonly two weeks, and occasionally four weeks or six weeks if it's something complex. This, the purpose of the sutures is really, one, to help hold the tissue down until you get enough healing processes to hold the tissue there naturally. But probably more importantly, the suture reminds the patient not to move. So patient management is crucial to these sort of grafts. It is um, almost as important as the surgery itself. So when, you're, when I was less experienced and younger, I tended to try and be nice to the patients all the time. So it's very important that you are, I don't know, kind of tough on the patients. You have to scare them. If you don't scare them, they won't do what you say. So you need to scare them and you need to tell them why. So don't brush your teeth, okay? When you finish these grafts, they're not to brush their teeth. If they're trying to brush their teeth, they're going to pull all the sutures out and they're going to damage the tissue. And the, but most importantly, they're going to move their lip a lot. Now, the crucial elements for any graft is blood supply, um, stability, and then suturing and closure or holding the tissue where you want it. Um, stability and blood supply rely on not moving too much. And soft tissue grafts often have, um, often have uh, attachments close to the lip or freedom or things like that. And if, if you have those, the uh, graft can move a lot while they're moving their lips. So the suture not only is there to help surgically, but it pulls on their lip or their gum or whatever when they try and move their lip and so it stops them from moving. Okay, so one of the big benefits of sutures that you leave there for a while is stop the patient from moving the graft. Um, sorry, I'm just kidding. This is the healing that we're expecting after a few, this is about one week where we've taken the graft from. Now you can see that we've had necrosis here in this area, very similar to if we'd done a free gingival graft. And similarly on the other side, even though I've done primary closure, we've got necrosis here, similar. So that's why the pain levels I find are similar. Now when you're closing these, um, little sutures like this are good for just stopping bleeding, but you often want compression, so you'll need quite a big heavy suture to go through the tissue and around the teeth to really compress that tissue down. That's mostly to stop bleeding because it's very vascular. When you take those deep layers, you tend to get a lot more bleeding than when you take the surface layer. Just a little follow up on that. That's about uh, three weeks after, and I, the, this case is new, too new, so I don't have any more recent pictures. I'll probably post some on right in probably one or two weeks. So that's just an example of, so you can see both of those cases that I've shown so far were tunneling, uh, and they're just different types. One was a vista coming from starting in the sulcus and working down. And now, of the two, and the other one is going through the gingival margin and working up. Of the two, the VISTA approach is probably, and that's which um, Chow with his pinhole technique, he uses a VISTA approach, um, although he doesn't cut the hole with a scalpel because then it wouldn't be pinhole, so he pokes the hole in the patient with a big needle. Um, the, the, uh, both of those have been tunnels. I'm going to show some where I raise flaps, and I don't really mind which way you go. There's advantages to raising flaps, particularly for big surgeries because you can see a lot better and sometimes it's a lot faster. Now, this case is a complex case, and I want to show you a few things. In this case, I did a uh, bone grafting procedure called periodontally accelerated osteogenic orthodontics. Um, it is a designed to allow the teeth to move more rapidly, and it's not the focus of this presentation, but what we can see before we even start is the diagnosis. So which Miller class, obviously Miller class one and two, uh, uh, recession where we have the papillas intact and class one is where we've got recession down to the mucogingival junction and class two is beyond that. So class, Miller class three and four recession are cases where we have lost the papillas, so the papilla has gone and then class three is down to the mucogingival junction and class four is beyond that. Now in this case you would look at it and you would go that's a class one you know, we've lost, maybe a class two, we've lost tissue down to the mucogingival junction, but the papillas are intact. Well, actually, it's not true. 
With many orthodontic cases where you've got crowded teeth, you've actually lost the papilla before you've started. So if you look carefully here, the papilla is actually should be up about there. So we've actually lost two millimetres of papillary height just because the teeth are crowded. And, and anyone who's done orthodontics will know that you, there's these cases like this where the teeth are overlapping and you warn the patient that they're going to get black triangles when you finish. So in this case, uh, we, we know that if we do orthodontics here, we've got a high risk of black triangles, so we warn the patient about that. But more importantly, we also want to warn them that they've got a high chance of further recession because almost all types of orthodontics in this area are going to be expansionary to some extent in crowded teeth like this, and we have no attached tissue here at all. We've basically, we've got attached one, maybe one millimetre of attached tissue, almost none. So if I pull the lip, the tissue lifts up all the way to the gingival margin. So very high risk. Now, we went through the periodontally accelerated uh, osteogenic orthodontic process. So we raised a full thickness flap, removed all the soft tissue, cut the holes as deep between the teeth as we could. Um, you use an allograft like Mineros, not, uh, and you don't put a membrane over it, and then we suture. Now, the teeth, this is straight after, the, the teeth straighten out, like the teeth look straight in about three weeks, okay? And the total orthodontic time for this patient was about four and a half to five months. So it does make the orthodontics incredibly rapid. As expected, when we finished this, we still had a bit of recession. We had lost a little bit of papilla height, and the frenum, which was pulling, was also affecting that central papilla. So in this particular case, I took tissue, but I used the, now I wanted robust tissue. I wasn't so worried about how pretty it looked. So when I'm not worried about how pretty it looks, I just want it to be as robust as possible. I'm gonna take that more surface layer of the palate and then scrape the epithelium off rather than raising a flap and taking the deeper layer. Uh, when I, want to de-epithelialise, I just get a scalpel and I basically scrape the graft with the side of the scalpel like I'm scaling a fish, I guess. Um, you just got to not push too hard, otherwise you chop your graft into many tiny grafts, uh, which is very sad. Okay, so the things not to do, don't chop your graft. Uh, three things not to do. One, don't let your assistant suction the graft up. That's very sad for both you and her uh, or him. Secondly, don't drop your graft on the floor. And thirdly, uh, don't chop it into tiny pieces when you're de-epithelializing. Now, I have seen on some places where people get a razor blade and actually shave off the top layer. I can't do that. My, the hand-eye coordination to actually shave a layer, like actually cut a layer off the top without cutting the graph in half, too hard for me. Uh, now, I don't use sutures anymore, but what I've done here is I've got surgery cell on the wound, so make sure it's not bleeding too much. If it's bleeding a lot, this won't work, so you've got to get the bleeding stopped first. If you're bleeding a lot where you've taken the graft from, then do a local anaesthetic injection, a big one, particularly on the distal end, which would be, I can't remember which end it is in this picture. Uh, and then when it's stopped bleeding. Now, what I do is I harvest the graft, then I go and place the graft, and once I've finished all the suturing and so on, I come back, and usually by then, the site where I took the graft from has stopped bleeding. Then I get some surgery cell, which is cellulose to stop uh, bleeding, and I cut a little piece and I pack it against the uh, harvest site, and that will just sit there quite nicely if it's not bleeding, and then get some uh, periacryl or some type of cyanoacrylate, or if you live somewhere where you can't get periacryl, just buy super glue, um, and paint it all over the surgery cell and on the surrounding tissue about two or three millimetres. Now, I think I mentioned this last time, don't drop it down the throat. It's very bad for patients if you super glue the back of the throat together, quite dangerous. Um, also very uncomfortable. Now, this is the healing photo just a few weeks later. And quite, one of the things about soft tissue grafts you need to understand is that they look horrendous one or two weeks later. And then in about six weeks later, they're going to have the least coverage of the tissues as possible. Uh, and then they will improve. And it's generally one of the few types of, well, not so much with allografts. If you use like, um, if you're using allodern and stuff like that, it doesn't really improve. Once it's healed, that's all you're going to get. But with natural tissue, which I tend to, I tended to go back to more, um, the, the tissue heals. And unlike most other types of dentistry, it actually looks better after a year. So the longer you leave it, the better it looks. 
pain-wise, comparing things like allografts to, to natural tissue, I don't find there's much pain difference between natural tissue. But the main reason I would use an allograft like uh, Alloderm is when I've got a huge graft to do. So if I've got a graft them from here to here and here to here all at once, then I might use Alloderm for that because it, you, you can buy as much as you want. Okay, If you, if you are doing smaller areas and uh, the soft tissue, the pain of the surgery is slightly more intense if you harvest from the pellet, but the healing is much faster. So you don't get the weeks and weeks and weeks of irritation that you get when you use basically collagen from a different person. So that's straight away, but this is about six months post-op. Okay, so you can see how much it's improved. <coughs> Very difficult to see the graft now. Complete coverage, and even more importantly, notice that even though I didn't cut the freedom, the freedom is not lifting up. So one of the aspects of a decent graft is that you actually stabilize the tissue, and the freedom will disappear a little bit of its own. Uh, and you can also see the thickness that we've achieved uh, with this particular type of graph. So that's uh, another tunneling process. Now, in this particular case, I decided not to tunnel. I probably could have. Um, I really wanted to get the graphs located in a particular position. And so I really wanted them to sit right at the top of that recession area. So I decided I would flap it open so I could actually suture the graphs into position more carefully and then close it. Now, when you're tunneling, you really have... You, when you tunnel, you're generally suturing the graft to the inside of the tunnel flap. Uh, whereas when you flap something open, you can actually suture the graft independently of where you put, wherever you put the flap. The issue when you raise flaps is that you are going to reduce your blood supply because you cut all the papillas, and you have to be much better at suturing because if you don't, uh, it's all going to open up and you'll get problems. Now, I did have a little problem with this case, and I'll show you that one in a moment. Uh, you won't, probably won't be able to see this detail on the webinar, but uh, what those arrows are pointing to is toothbrush trauma. So everywhere, everywhere where you see little white scratches on the gingiva, it's toothbrush trauma. Now, recession is multifactorial. It can be from you need predisposing factors. You need to have a patient who has no buccal bone on the tooth, which is just about everyone, and then you need to have generally tissue that's thinner, although you can see this patient's biotype is quite thick. Uh, and then generally you need some form of irritation, whether it's plaque, whether it's uh, occlusion, you know, the clenching grind. But in this particular case, notice the lady, she's got quite a lot of wear on her front teeth. She actually has more wear on her two incisors than anywhere else, but she has less recession. So in this case, it's very hard to argue that it's an occlusal trauma issue. It's more of a toothbrush trauma. And in fact, she has toothbrush cuts. So look at the gingiva where you have recession. If you see little white and pink scratches on the gum or little white lines on the gum, it's probably toothbrush trauma. Uh, obviously, recession is quite bad on this side. You can see how much recession we have. Now, there's a lot of debate as to whether you should treat the tooth with uh, EDTA or whether you should use citric acid or whether you should use some type of antibiotic um, or just how you should clean the root surface. I don't actually think it matters that much. You definitely should clean the root surface to you know, remove toxins and things that would otherwise be on the surface of the tooth. I have done it many different ways. Um, just clean it with something. I usually use EDTA. So you can see that I scale with an ultrasonic pumice, and then I use EDTA, I gel or liquid, I don't really care. I give it a scrub with a micro brush just to clean it. Now, some people do this after they've raised the flap. I prefer to do it before. I just find that it's easier to control where we're going on the tissue if I do this before. Now, this is the plan cuts, and the reason they like this is because we're going to, this is the new papilla. So this is going to rotate down here to form a bit, and as it rotates down, it's going to pull the tissue down. So, so when you have really big recessions, in some ways it's a bit easier to control the flap if you actually raise the flap rather than tunnel. Um, when you're tunneling, you tend to get a lot of tissue bunching up. So if you tunnel over here where you've got this huge recession, as you pull it down, you get all this tissue bunching up. It probably doesn't matter that much. Um, what I will say for sure is if you do one technique all the time, you'll be better at it than other techniques. So if you tunnel all the time, then tunneling will be better. If you raise a flap all the time, raising a flap will be better. This is the planned uh, incisions across the pillar and where they're supposed to elevate. And there's a mistake over here. I've made it too close to the recession. You can see there, that's where it should be. So the incision should be here, but it's up there. So 
you will see how this affects the case later on by having that incision in the wrong position. There's the incisions there. These are, so they're partial thickness in this area. So we did a little bit of partial thickness flat and then full thickness up a little ways and then partial thickness again. Uh, you probably need to watch the surgery to understand the difference between all those changes from partial to full and partial thickness. What I will say is if you go onto our academy uh, on the paid part of the site, there's quite a few full length videos of these uh, uh, soft tissue procedures in particular. Uh, going around. Now, this bit here is not too interesting. Uh, now, this is a de-epithelialized graft. And what's very important is you have to make sure that you have removed the epithelium completely and you don't want the graft to be too thick, okay? About a millimeter is good. If you have a millimeter thick, you're probably going to get a little bit more than a millimeter of tissue thickness increase, um, just because of a little bit of scarring that occurs either side. Uh, if you go too thick, then you get, either you can, can get graft necrosis, so it can be hard to get enough blood, and then you can get an infection. Uh, also, it can be very difficult to close the flap, and also it doesn't look aesthetic if you make it too thick, because you end up with a big bulge at the gum tissue. So uh, this particular case, I have placed graphs on both sides and I'm able to locate them with little sutures. Now, these sutures were non-dissolving, so they start on the palate and then go around and then they go around to the other side and that allows us to not have any knots underneath the flap. If you're going to have knots under the flap, then you should use resorbable sutures. And we suture it down. Now, you can see immediately, because I did that incision in the wrong spot, this papilla area here is not closing down properly. And so later on, I will actually get a little scar in that area, but I shouldn't have. Um, this area here probably should have done that incision a little bit more coronal as well. You can see once again, both places I'm having trouble closing. Uh, now, the this was a huge graft, okay? It was all on one side. We took it from the, basically almost at the front of the mouth all the way around, around the back with the tuberosity. I've tried to avoid this area here at the front because the rugi are a nuisance when you're de-epithelializing. Uh, and if you don't do it carefully, you end up with rugi in your graft, uh, which doesn't look that great. So now, this is a, about a week later. Um, patient had, I think one day, about two days after which she said she had a fair bit of pain. So to stop the pain, we give them four milligrams of dexamethasone before we start. Uh, and we give them a thousand milligrams of Panadol or Paracetamol before we start. And then afterwards I would give her, unless there was some medical reason not to, I'd give her Diclofenac or Voltaren as the brand name, which is an anti-inflammatory long acting and also a narcotic analgesic like Tremadol. Uh, now, the narcotic analgesic is not for them to take necessarily unless it's severe. Usually if they're taking anti-inflammatory and Panadol and they keep taking it continuously, from straight after the procedure while they're still numb and you've given them dexamethasone, they don't get very much pain at all. Uh, the dressing that's on here really only has to stay there. I don't suture them anymore. They really only need to stay there for three or four days. And if they fall off at that point, then the patient, the tissue has recovered enough that it's not so painful. <coughs> now, speaking of patients, this trauma here is because the patient forgot that it was there and she was doing something in the shower and she accidentally stabbed herself in the in the, I think she went to put her hand up somehow and accidentally stabbed herself in the gum and half tore the suture. So that is the type of thing that patients can do to your work. No matter how good your work is, if the patient does something like that, then you're going to get problems. You can see that this little flap here is opening up a tiny bit. Now it's not going to affect the coverage of the recession, okay? But it is going to mean that it doesn't look as pretty because I did that incision too close or too uh, apical. I should have made that incision a little bit more coronal and then I've had a little bit more tissue to pull down. Uh, you'll see it. Now it will eventually smooth over but you will always see a very slight scar line there uh, which could have been avoided. So we can see the before and after. This is this is about 12 weeks after the procedure so before we had I think five or six millimetres of recession and covered over. I've used, uh, the reason I used the more dense surface layer for this graft is because <clears throat> this patient is horrendously traumatic with a toothbrush. Now, I know that some of you will go, why don't you teach the patient to brush better? Um, I used to believe I could change patients' habits. Now I don't. 
you can sometimes change their habits, but when people brush too hard, they're just going to brush too hard. And if they don't brush too hard, they're going to leave plaque. And, and trying to convince them to brush like it's a violin and not a shovel is just horrendously difficult. So I had one patient, he goes, he, I was doing graft, and he goes, look, I'm so proud of, I'm brushing, my toothbrush is lasting twice as long now. I said, how long is it lasting? He goes, four weeks. So it used to only last two weeks. So that was after months and months and months of training him every time he came in, he could only get his toothbrush to last four weeks. Uh, now, I've talked about how important it is to remove the epithelium. I'll show you what happens if it doesn't. So this particular case, I've posted it recently. I haven't posted the follow-ups. We did big grafts. <clears throat> I wanted big, heavy graft material to cover the uh, exposed threads. Uh, but if I look carefully, I can see some epithelium here. There's a little bit there. And there's a little bit up there. Okay, I've made some mistakes. And what has happened is... When it heals, this is about two weeks later, it's actually, it looks like it's infected, okay? When you push on it, fluid or pus comes out there. Now, the graft isn't infected, but what's happened is we've got a cyst between, so the epithelium layer on the surface of the graft has, has not, often it necroses and basically disappears, but in this case, it's had enough blood supply to stay living, so we've got epithelium stuck underneath a flap. Uh, so the patient came back in, she had all swelling, and I thought, oh no, I've, it's all died, and I'm going to have to do the whole case again. And I put her on antibiotics for a few weeks, and then she still had this terrible swelling there. And you can see in this picture, <coughs> I've numbed her up, but this is, this is on top of the graft. So the graft is under there, and it's perfectly healthy, but I can get an instrument in there on top. So essentially, I'm going to have to convert this into a free gentable graft because... I haven't removed all the epithelium and I've put a flap down over the top and now we're getting a cystic type behaviour. So that's one of the crucial things that can go wrong with the subepithelium connected tissue graft is that you don't, if you do take the surface layer and remove the epithelium and you don't remove it all, then you can get a cyst. Uh, in this particular case, what I did was I anaesthetised her and I actually I'll cut quite a few little tiny incisions through the overlying so that all the fluid that's building up underneath could drain out. And then I also removed a tiny little patch. So what will happen is over time, the overlying mucosa will just slowly recede back and the graft will come through underneath. It'll essentially end up looking like a free gingival graft. Uh, I used the surface layer on this one because I was trying to cover implants and I wanted the most robust tissue possible. Also, I needed a lot of tissue. Um, Maybe it would have been better to take the deeper layer of tissue uh, closer to the bone, and then I wouldn't have this issue of the epithelium, okay? That's hindsight for you. Another thing that can happen is, now this is not a standard subepithelial connective tissue graft, it's a rotational graft, but what you can see is there's all these sutures everywhere here, I'm not worried about that. You'll see a suture there, and there's a suture there. Those sutures are tying off the greater palatine artery because I cut it. Okay, I looked at that case and I thought, oh, pretty high chance I'm going to cut the artery, and I did. Okay, don't panic. I can panic for a little bit and then stop. Um, you can see it here. There's the two sutures there. So it shows up a bit better. All those, these big figure of eight sutures are compression sutures to hold the tissue down so it doesn't swell up and bleed just in general. But these two here are just to tie off the artery. And it kind of goes a bit like this. So your artery is up here. So get a mirror handle and press where you think the artery is and see if it stops bleeding. Okay, if it stops bleeding, most of the time when you cut this artery, it's not going to like jet. Sometimes it will jet across the room, but most of the time it's just going to bleed and it's going to bleed a lot. Um, and you're going to be thinking, oh, the patient's going to drown because there's blood going everywhere in the back of the throat. So first of all, stop what you're doing. Get your suction. Okay, don't drop the graft on the floor. Don't stop that much. Okay, but get your suction. Get your assistant in there and then press where you think the artery should be. So usually um, in the area of the second molar, halfway from the midline of the palate to the digital margin, get your mirror handle and press really hard. Now, if you're in the right spot, the bleeding will stop. If you're not in the right spot, press somewhere else until you're in the right spot. So keep pressing until you find a spot where the bleeding basically stops. And press hard. Don't be, don't be, you know, Miss Lily Fingers. Just really press hard. Now, once you're in the right spot, do a big injection in that spot. So get your local anaesthetic and do a full capsule of anaesthetic. The pressure of the anaesthetic and the adrenaline 
will help compress the vessel and it will bleed a lot less when you take the mirror handle away. Now, the other thing is that if you look at the curve of the pallet, if you use a normal suture needle, which is going to be a 3 8 of a circle, not a half circle, so most of this, our sutures are 3 8 of a circle, if you put a 3 8 of a circle needle in there, it's not going to come out because the pallet is a 3 8 of a circle. So you need to buy half round circle sutures. So sutures that are a half a circle so that when you push it in and go around the pallet, it actually will come back out again. Now, if you have an emergency and you discover that you don't have sutures of this type, get your needle on a 3 8 and bend it a bit. Turn it into a 1 half, okay? That's what I did in this case. It's best if you have monofilament, so something like nylon or polypropylene or Teflon, or Teflon's actually not a monofilament, but it acts like one. Uh, some sort of monofilament type suture in a big gauge, so like a 3 -0. When you do a lot of soft tissue suturing, we're using 6-0 and 7-0 sutures, and so we tend to think that 3-0 is like rope, okay, it's so big. Um, but that's the type of suture you need when you really want massive compression. So you put it down, and when you found where the artery is, you go right down to the bone, and then you bring your suture back out, and you tie it. And if you're in the right spot, it will stop bleeding. If it's still bleeding, do it again somewhere else. If it's still bleeding, do it again. So keep doing it. Uh, in this particular case, I showed you I had to do two sutures before it would stop bleeding. And you, just to refresh, so here's your second molar. You're generally going to be about halfway between here and here. Okay, now bear in mind that there is an, uh, this artery coming out of here is pretty small, so we're not too worried about it. It'll stop bleeding on its own. Uh, the best place to cut where you won't hit too many things is right there, so that's the anastomosis is about the canine region. Uh, Remember that if you actually raise the periosteum off the, off the bone and take that with the graft, then you are probably going to get quite a bit of bleeding there too because there's a lot of blood vessels in particularly younger patients coming down through the actual palate bone itself. And also remember, there's, uh, if you take the periosteum, you may also affect the nerves that come down through the palate as well. Now, the last thing that can happen is what happens if you don't if you aren't able to hold your tissue down correctly uh, or you're using the denser layer of the tissue and it, uh, your flap doesn't really hold properly or you take the sutures out. So this is a case, one of, this is one of my very first cases. It was years ago. Um, it's done the job, but it's not, so, it's not a lot of finesse. Definitely see there's toothbrush scratches up there where she has the recession. Uh, maybe there's an occlusal issue, it's a bit hard to say. She has occlusal issues everywhere across the front here, so not just in the area where the recession is, so a bit hard to say. Um, but she certainly has toothbrush trauma right there and there. Now, this particular case, it's an old case, so I don't do it like this anymore, but I want to show you what happens if you don't keep the flat closed. Uh, I raise the flat. In this case, it's a full thickness flat, and then I split the flap up higher. So basically, you just raise a normal split thickness flap to the mucogingival junction, and then get a scalpel and start filleting the flap off the bone, okay? And then it becomes split thickness. A split thickness flap will be able to be more stretchy. Uh, in this case, actually, there was a rough edge there, which I trimmed off with a fine diamond burr and polished, and then EDTA took a graft. Now, this graft is uh, the surface tissue, so it's like a fringingual graft that we have de-epithelialized, like so. And this is my old days when I used to use big, nasty sutures, and I have knots here at the gingival margin, which is all wrong. Uh, that will make it difficult for the flap to heal in the right spot without scarring along that area. Also, I don't use, this is like 4-0 gut sutures, and see this knot, it's huge. Right where you want the tissue to be nice and delicate, you've got a massive knot, don't do that. Okay, also I was using 4-0 Teflon, which is too big, and all this sort of stuff. Okay, what's most important is that I haven't held the tissue down very well, and I took the sutures out at one week. So it looks good at one week, but then the patient got in there, sutures were gone, she forgot that she wasn't supposed to brush, gets in there, brushes like crazy, and the tissue moved up. So this is healing. Uh, now, this is at about six weeks. So remember, six weeks, the tissue is at the... It's not the worst looking, but it'll have the least coverage at about the six week mark. So it tends to recede back a little bit and then you'll get creeping attachment as the tissue matures. So we haven't got any creeping attachment yet, um, but you can see the overlying flap has receded way back and now we've got this scar line, which even after 
healing was fairly high and then I tried to remove it with a burr, okay? But even, uh, this is about a year later, I've still got a little scar line there and I probably could abrade that back a little bit more with a burr. But here we are about four years later. You can see we've had some creeping attachments come down. There's still toothbrush trauma, so you can still see the cuts, but that really dense tissue is holding up nicely. Uh, but she definitely still has a scar line up here. Now, it's not an issue for this particular patient. She doesn't have a high lip line. She's not that fussy. She mostly had the graft for sensitivity, but just bear in mind that that's what can happen if you take the sutures out too soon uh, or if the patient gets in there and brushes too soon. Now, one more little thing that I've seen go wrong, and this is a very rare one. I don't think I've ever heard anyone else talk about it. This particular patient had massive trauma from an attack by a person with a hammer, and he has a titanium plate down here because he had a fracture, his mandible and his maxilla and his face were all fractured. He's got titanium plates everywhere. Uh, the process of oral and maxillofacial surgery has left this tooth, some of these teeth non-vital, and we're worried about the tissue receding. We can't do bone grafts here. We can't do implants easily because of all the surgeries already had. So I did a tunneling approach. So I've tunneled here and then we feed in the graft like so. This is a surface layer of the epithelium with the epithelium removed and then did a single continuous sling suture. So just one suture to hold everything in place. All healed fairly nicely. This is at six weeks, but this non-vital tooth actually went black after surgery. So whether it, I think it was the blood from the surgery had kind of infused into the tooth and it went black. Hadn't been black before, but it went quite black after the surgery in the root section there. So just something to keep in mind. I haven't seen this published anywhere, and it may have been. Uh, if you're doing surgery near non-vital teeth, there's a very small chance the root, particularly lower teeth, could go... Uh, could go stained from the blood, okay? So there's some things to watch out for. One, be ready for bleeding. If you cut the artery, tie it off, don't panic. Uh, have big sutures available, big 3-0 sutures available for tying off arteries. Remember that the only artery in the head and neck region that you can't tie off is the internal carotid, okay? All the other ones you can tie off. If you tie that one off, then the patient might feel a bit unwell. Uh, and don't let the patient traumatise it. Scare the patient so that they don't treat the graft roughly. Don't allow them to eat anything harder than a scrambled egg for about two weeks. Don't let them brush. Make sure they use Savicol or whatever um, and pain relief and so on. Okay, but very important that they don't have any food harder than a scrambled egg and don't brush the area where the graft is for at least two weeks. And when you do start them brushing, you want them doing this like gentle sweeping motion okay if you frighten the patient enough then they will really want to and i, I don't mean frighten them with the procedure i frighten them of what will go wrong if they do stupid stuff then they will behave but if you don't they'll do stupid stuff that's how patients are um, the reason why patients do stupid stuff is because they don't appreciate how frustrating how painful how difficult how costly it is to repair a surgery that's gone wrong and they don't realize how easily it goes wrong if they do the wrong thing. So you have to make them aware of how badly the procedure will go if they do anything they shouldn't. Uh, and if you do that, then they will be well behaved. Thank you very much for listening. Now, if you have some questions, I'm gonna answer those now. Um, they will be coming through to me in a moment. Uh, obviously, I'll be in Sweden teaching this. It's probably too late for any of you to go uh, very shortly. And with Flora and Bobby from Romania, we'll be teaching soft tissue grafting in about June next year. Uh, and I will go and grab my phone so I can get the questions. Okay, we have some questions coming up, so send them through. This one is from uh, Christopher Sale. <clears throat> How thick should the donor tissue be? So the answer to that is it depends. If it's the deeper tissue against the bone, then I don't really care how thick it is. That tissue seems to be able to absorb uh, or get perfusion. And I've seen people use very thick ones. I've used very thick ones and it doesn't seem to matter at all. If you're using uh, the surface layer of the tissue with the epithelium removed, then it's ideal for it to be about a millimetre thick, maybe 1.5 at the max. If you're starting to get up to two millimetres, you're getting a lot of risk. Um, it's better for it to be thin and good than to be thick and no good, okay? So one 
one millimeter is ideal, 1.5 is max if it's the dense surface tissue. If it is the, if it's like the, the deeper tissue is kind of really soft and floppy tissue, okay? So it's very hard to measure how thick it is because if you squeeze it with calibers, it gets thinner. So that I'm not so worried about. You can make it as thick as you can. You're going to be limited to how thick you can make it anyway because you've got the epithelium and then you've got the bone and you can't get much between that. So that stuff you can make as thick as you like. Uh, this is from Sam. Do you, do you crown up to the CJ or extend more than that in special cases? Uh, I'm assuming that this is that case I was doing. So in that case I did, I did, you obviously only do a temporary crown until you have full healing. When you do a graft in the anterior, you don't want to do your final restorative work for probably between four months and six months. Okay, You need to wait a long time for the tissue to mature uh, because the tissue, if you do the crown too soon and the tissue starts getting creeping attachment, you could end up with inflamed tissue over the margin of your crown, or it actually grows down over the crown. So wait, wait four to six months in the anterior to make sure the tissue is stable. Uh, so you're limited now. You're going to be limited by how far you can bring the tissue down, which will depend. Remember that you can generally, if you want to know how far you can bring tissue down, look at the papilla. In most cases, you're never going to bring the tissue down more than three millimeters from the papilla. So if the papilla is here, and you've got recession up to here, you're only going to bring it down to three millimetres from the papilla uh, as long as the papilla is wide. If you have these super skinny papillas that go up for miles, you're never going to bring it down to three millimetres to the top of the papilla. It's just not enough blood supply. It's not enough bone. It's, it's not going to happen. Uh, in the current photo, would the root now, I can't remember which photo that, would the rugi area affect the quality of the graph? Uh, the... Rugi don't affect the quality of the graft, but if they're still present and you're not careful, they will show up on the final tissue. So if they stay submerged and they're properly de epithelialized and you keep the flap over the top, then it won't really matter. But in general, I want to remove the Rugi as much as possible. So either remove them before you harvest the tissue. You can de epithelialize the tissue before you harvest, so you can actually get a burr and go around and cut all the epithelium off the tissue before you actually lift it off the pallet. I've tried that a few times. I think it's actually more difficult to get all the epithelium off than if you actually take the graft and then scrape it off. But you'll have to try that. So really don't affect the graft quality, but they can affect the aesthetics if they ever show. Uh, last photo you showed of the recent case, which you said would show soon on the right. Ah, okay, sorry. That's, um, is it safe to extend the graft at the donor up to tooth number eight? Um, now I'm not sure if that's if that's American number eight, which would be the central incisor, or if you mean the eight, which is the third molar. So uh, I assume that you mean the central incisor. You can ex you generally can't extend the graft any further forward than the lateral incisor because as you get to the central incisor, you start going around the corner. So to go from the lateral to the central is not going to give you any more tissue. And then you're going to have the incisive papilla and the tissue there is incredibly sensitive and you're going to be have a very it's where you put your tongue to say s and f and all sorts of words so i wouldn't go right around unless you look you can actually take all the tissue off the entire palate if you need to but uh, your patient's going to be a little bit unhappy if you do so i have seen cases where they've completely de they've taken all the tissue off the entire palate. So in oral and maxillofacial surgery, they sometimes do that. I mean, remember in maxillofacial surgery, sometimes they take all the tissue off the palate and they rotate it around with the blood vessels attached to close a wound from a surgery treatment, uh, a cancer treatment. So it'll grow back, um, but the patient's generally going to be a bit sore if you take their entire palate off. So I wouldn't do that. So uh, the the but going around there now wisdom teeth i definitely extend down around the wisdom tooth area so i go the graft extends down around the uh tuberosity so you can kind of go all the way down around behind the second molar and even around to the buckle in fact some people who have a lot of tissue on the buckle of their sort of first second and third molar region so they have big wide areas of attached tissue you can actually take a graft from the buckle um, really only a fridge interval graft, but you can take it from the buckle and the tissue colour on the buckle actually matches the 
rest of the buccal tissue, which is a kind of more bright red. If you go to the palate, it's kind of a whiter color. And if you get a tissue off on the palate and you stick it on the buccal, it often will show up as slightly different if it's a free gingival graft. So you can take it from the buccal of the six or seven if there's enough tissue there. Certainly when you're taking that strip off, you can go from the lateral incisor and you can go all the way down around the back of the second molar and almost all the way to the buckle. You can get, you can usually get a graft big enough to do about probably eight teeth if you do that. Uh, here's another one from Christopher. Presumably there's quicker healing and suture removal with tunnel procedures. Um, no, not really, okay? The main reason you do tunnel procedures is they generally look better because they don't have the scars from the cuts. Um, they look better with less skill, so you, uh, it's more difficult to make them look bad. Uh, whereas if you raise a flap, if you don't have really good skills with your suturing and it comes open, then you'll have scars. Uh, you're going to leave, with tunnel procedures, you're going to leave the sutures in for about two weeks. If you flap it open, you're probably going to leave the sutures in for two weeks. It doesn't make any difference. Uh, Pain-wise, it doesn't make that much difference either. It says, Michael says, do you prefer using a scalpel post-excision or a burr pre-incision to de-epithelialize the surface epithelium? <clears throat> I prefer using a scalpel. I tried using a burr. I find it's actually quite difficult to tell whether you've removed all the tissue. Um, it's actually a lot more awkward than it looks to de-epithelia. Maybe I just haven't done it enough, or maybe I don't have the right burr. Maybe I need a bigger, a bigger round of burr. I don't know, but I, it could also be that I'm just used to scraping with a scalpel blade post-harvest, and that's why I do it that way. <clears throat> this is from Sushen. How to ensure complete de-epithelialization of the graft <clears throat> and the most efficient way to do it. So. When you have epithelium, it looks shiny. So when you look at your graft, if it looks shiny, you haven't removed all the epithelium, okay? It's very simple. So when you scrape it, you need to scrape it until there's no shiny bits left. The problem is around the edge of the graft, there's often little tags of epithelium that are hard to remove and you might actually have to cut them off. So keep scraping it until it, there's no shiny bits left. The rugi, I may want to get a fresh scalpel blade and actually cut the rugi off so it's nice and flat. Um, this is from Salvatore, uh, post-surgical information to the patients after surgery. Uh, <clears throat> so the most important thing is you must frighten the life out of the patient not to brush. <clears throat> if they brush, they're going to destroy everything, okay? Because these patients have a recession because they brush too hard. So if they brush, they, they're going to tear your sutures out, they're going to tear your tissue up, they're going to push your graft up. So you need to tell you, look, if you brush, you will destroy this work and then I'll, you'll have all this pain and you'll have nothing. Okay, you must blame the patient. So <clears throat> rule number one, frighten the patient so they behave. Soft food. And you need to tell them what soft food is. Some people think the soft food is like not eating a rock. Okay, so, so they will go, oh, well, there's only a carrot. They go, I only eat salads. Oh, salads are hard. Okay, a carrot's awful. Okay, an apple's awful. So you have to tell them what soft food is. So I say scrambled egg. Okay, anything harder than a scrambled egg is too hard. Um, mouthwash, I get them to use Savocol, which is chlorhexidine mouthwash. So use mouthwash, take painkillers, don't move. Now, the less they move their lip, the better. So the less they talk, the less they smile, the less they, they mustn't look, don't want them in there lifting their lip up. Because you imagine the patient pulling their lip way up and stretching all your tearing all your switches out. So you don't want them looking, you don't want them doing anything. Um, Basically, the less they do, the better. I generally tell them to have three or four days off so they can hide. Um, you also need to tell them they're probably going to get a bruise. The tissue here is very thin. It's only five millimetres thick, okay? So if you get a tiny bit of bleeding up here, you pop one tiny little arteriole, it's going to bleed underneath there, and they're going to get a bruise. It will come up on their lip, and then it will spread down their cheek and go into their chin, and they're going to... So you need to warn them that they'll get a bruise. Um... Barbara says, what are your thoughts on the chow pinhole procedure? Basically, it's a VISTA technique. You do a VISTA and you stuff collagen in there. Um, I haven't seen long-term follow-ups on many cases from anyone I trust. Obviously, you never trust the person who invents it because they're biased and they will tell you that it works 100% of the time. Uh, so, but other people I know say in like minor cases, it's very good, but 
big recessions, which is all the ones I tend to get, maybe not so good. Um, Sushin says, can you elaborate more on the suturing technique? Not really. In a webinar, it's extremely difficult to talk about the actual way you do suturing because you need to do video. Uh, so go on to the academy. There's lots of videos there that are full length surgery videos that show the suturing. Uh, suturing is just, there's, there's about, the suturing is by far the most important part. So I'm sorry I can't do it, but to explain how to suture someone on a lecture is very, very difficult. Okay, it would take me about 30 minutes to explain how to do uh, an apical sling. Uh, so I'm sorry I can't answer that particular question. Uh, Dr. Anish, what should be the ideal time to protect the graft? Two weeks at least. Okay, after two weeks it's pretty stable, but you want to still, even at that point, frighten the patient. Now, if you're really worried, leave the sutures in for up to six weeks. They're a monofilament, so they won't get irritated. But leaving the sutures in reminds the patient that they need to behave. Uh, Gia, how long should you wait after grafting prior to starting ortho? <laughs> Um, I start ortho sometimes straight away. Uh, probably I would, I mean, often I have the brackets on because then you can suture over the brackets. That's very handy. Uh, uh, otherwise, I would wait two weeks and then get your ortho going. Okay, it's fine at that point. <coughs> uh, depending on the type of ortho it is. Some, some cases I do ortho straight away. Some cases where I know that they're going to get recession, I'll actually graft first. So if you are 100% certain that they're going to get recession, just graft first and then wait for it to heal. Uh, and once it's healed up six or eight weeks or something, then do it. But if you really have to get going, then it depends on the type of graft, okay? If it's so but the graft, because remember when you put braces in, people can't clean and it's all plaque everywhere and they've got to brush their teeth hundreds of times. So you want it to be pretty stable before you encourage the patient to do all these bad behaviours. But I have actually grafted during orthodontics, as you can see. So that one case I showed you, the patient had braces on. Uh, the answer is, it depends. Okay, this is the last question, because it's bedtime here. Um, Christopher Sale again. What happens to the bunch tissues during tunnel technique over time? They basically disappear in most cases and you won't be able to see it. Okay, okay I'll do one more for Carolina. Uh, what type of sutures do you use to place the graft? If I've got to leave the sutures buried, I'm going to leave the knot underneath the flap, then I'm going to use a uh, resorbable, so just like 5-O-chromic gut or 6-O-chromic gut. Uh, if I, or I use the suture so that it starts from the pallet side, goes around, stabilizes the graft, comes back around, stabilizes the graft, and then tie on the lingual so that the knot can be removed later. Uh, otherwise, if you've got to leave the sutures underneath, then use chromic gut. Uh, Christian says, what procedure would you recommend to start out with to get a good start with? And so what you need to remember is that most of you, this is my last question, this is my last, last question. Okay, they're all laughing over there. It's, my, it's like when my wife says it's her favourite song. Okay, she has about 100 favourite songs. And then it's like the most favourite song and then the most, most favourite song. So this is the last, last, this is like the Rolling Stones' last ever tour, okay? Which they've done about 20 of. <clears throat> um, most of you will have done restorative dentistry for years and years and years, and guess what? You're still doing courses on it. So after five years, 10 years, 20 years of doing fillings, you're still learning how to do fillings. For some reason, people think that when they learn how to do surgery, they'll do one course and they know how to do it. You won't. Okay, you will do one course and then you'll do a little bit, not very well, and then you'll go and do another course and you'll do a little bit of stuff at home, not very well, and then you'll do another course and you'll do a little bit of stuff at home and you'll get a bit better, okay? Just like when you learn to do fillings. What is important is that when you do your first graft, first of all, give yourself a lot of time. So if you think it's going to take one hour, book four. Your first grafts will take three times longer than you think, okay? Because you're not used to all this sort of fancy suturing. Uh, <clears throat> don't do it in a highly aesthetic area or on a young model who will sue you for millions if it goes wrong. You want to do it up the back on an old patient who, you, and you need to do it in a case where you're trying to prevent recession. So your first grafts, you shouldn't be doing aesthetic ones, you should be doing ones to prevent recession, and if I get coverage, that's a good deal. If you're trying to do the, like that one I showed you where I was bringing the tissue down and on, where she had the temporary crowns on it, that is really difficult, okay? Incredibly difficult graft. Don't try and do something like that to start with. It won't probably work. <clears throat> 
Um, and I can't do any more because I've said it was my last, last question. So uh, now there are a few more questions here. If you send in more questions later, those of you watching the replay, I will try and answer them maybe next week sometime or when I'm in Sweden, we'll see. I'll go to Sweden next week. Uh, Feel free to uh, share the link for the webinar with your friends. They can watch it on replay if they register. Uh, and I'll let you know. Now, the next one will be probably on something a bit more simple. Okay, we've, we've done a lot of surgery in the recent ones, so we'll go back to something a bit more simple. Thank you very much for watching. I've had a great time. I hope you have too. Uh, send in some more questions. If you haven't, I'll try and answer them later. Thanks very much. Have a good night.